first off, I want to welcome you guys to Skiba's Gym. This is a unique place. We want to thank Henri Skiba for being the host. It's an amazing gym. If you guys ever want to come train here, the atmosphere is incredible. We got a guy in the house, one of the best bench pressers in the world. Uh, and besides the bench press, he's a great overall lifter. He's got a great build. They call him Guns. You can see why. Uh, so feel free. Please ask some questions. Our other guest here, uh, if you guys don't know who Dan Green is, he's a world-class lifter, one of the best lifters in the world. Uh, I saw him at Raw Unity in the 220 class, uh, set the world record for total without knee wraps, but he beat the total for the guy that had knee wraps. Ask questions of either of these guys, just direct a question to who you want to uh, ask it of. So ask Dan, ask Garrett, and um, fire away, guys. How frequent do I bench? Um, if it's a bench only meet, uh, my last meet, which I just did seven weeks ago, I hit the 5:30. Um, I bench three times a week: Monday, Wednesday, and Saturday. Um, my focus wasn't full power, so I was able to do that. Um, some people would say it's a lot of benching. It, it is, but it works. Now your programming has to be on point for it. You can't just—it's not a max out every day. It's, you know, I had specific programming for each day. And, the reps to do for each one and then when it comes to a full power meet I drop down to benching two times a week a Monday and a Friday and, you know just getting bigger and stronger you need your technique to simply be good enough so you can train hard without breaking your shoulders down um, but the best side the best the best thing for setting up is to set up the same way every time and take that seriously you know don't you know don't let excitement get in the way of proper setup you know when you're going for a heavy attempt so you should set your set your grip, set your back, set your hips, set your legs the same every time. I just kind of see what it feels like if I can move up and down without having any tightness kind of shift my balance forward and back. So just getting to where I feel like now my hips are set, but I'm also in kind of an athletic position, you know, where I can quickly move up and down. And once I got that, the last thing I'll do is any any kind of final thought. <laughs> Hopefully not too much thinking when you're about to lift. But uh, the last thing I'll do is I'll breathe in before I set myself to reach down for the bar. Um, I feel like when I breathe in before I reach for the bar, I can create a lot of internal pressure and then by bending down, I can basically add to that pressure versus how much pressure I can build up when I'm already bent down holding, on the, holding onto the bar. I find it's kind of hard to really in, inflate my, uh, my rib cage and my belly. So once I've got my air, I reach down, set my grip and go. But the, the setup is basically just setting my hips exactly where I want them and kind of eyeballing my grip before I reach down. Yeah, I mean, like Dan said, um, your position at the bottom, I do take a breath once I, when I put my hand on the bar. I take it at that point, it just because it, it feels comfortable for me. But um, my whole thing I think about when I'm pulling sumo is, is driving my legs down first and trying to get my, my legs to lock before the rest of the body comes up. You know, I really try and force the legs out and try and push through through the floor. The motion you kind of perform on the way down mirrors the motion you'll execute on the way, way up. So in other words, if you don't really load up your quads on the way down, you're probably not gonna load them up very well on the way back up. So you'll wind up shooting your hips back. Um, <clears throat> if you don't really set your, your stomach well against your belt, or if you're not squatting the belt, if you arch your back too much, uh, for example, like if you're trying to really pull your chest up more than you need to, the big reason there is that a lot of people will get the cues like head up, chest up, and they will do that too much. Um, squatting is a very athletic motion, and I think people want you know to be told, okay, hips all the way back, and then knees all the way out, or you know, chest all the way up. But really, everything has to be the right amount. I mean, accessory work is—you just have to remember what accessory work is there for. Accessory work is there so that you can kind of stay prepared to lift heavy for the next workout or the workouts to come. You know, so if your accessory work helps you to keep your, you know, your joints feeling good because you'll do, you know, 100, you know, cable press downs and that makes your elbows feel pumped up and good, then doing that for a max, is, if that's going to make your elbows hurt, you know, versus make your elbows feel good, you just have to remember what you're going for. 
You know, if you're trying to get big from your accessory work and you have a ton of energy on your accessory work, that probably means you didn't put enough energy into your main lifts. I'll probably, you know, sometimes I'll cut and sometimes I'll go for a weight gain and, you know, competing at higher weight classes. My next meet, I'm competing at 242. Um, I don't really know what I'm going to do after that, so. I think for me, um, I always want to cut to 198 for full power because for full power, that's where I'm highly competitive at. 220 is not a full power class for me. But as far as benching, I do a couple of bench only meets a year, and I usually do those at 220. I don't really take a lot of deloading except for right before the meet. Um, if I feel like I'm starting my workout and I can't hit the weights, then that's, that's really when I start to deload. If I just can't hit the weights I intended to hit. Uh, but usually I'm pretty good about, you know, if I need an extra day, I might, you know, I might stall and deadlift Saturday instead of Friday. Um, but usually I kind of know where I'm at. And if, I, if I'm not hitting a weight, it's probably because I'm messing something up and I can alter my technique and come back and make it. The only, time, the only thing I really deload is bench, because I'll try to bench as often as possible, and then sometimes I need to take an extra day or two of rest, just as the forearms get really beaten up. When I get closer to the meet, I will deadlift less, and that's where I'll deadlift four weeks out and I'll deadlift two weeks out. And that will give me a little more rest for the back and that's pretty important so that your back is pretty fresh when you get to the competition. For me, I usually like to go with an eight week cycle and I feel like with the eight week training cycle going into a meet, I could pretty much go hard and not, you know, if I stretch it to 10 or 12, then that's when everything starts to feel kind of beat up. I feel like I could go hard for eight weeks, not deload at all until basically the week before the meet, you know, so. I'm taking all my max attempts probably, or my heavier sets, within 10 to 14 days before the meet, you know? And then I like to take five days off before the meet. I feel like you could keep making gains probably for the first two years you added to powerlifting. You're not gonna feel the effects of being too beat up in these training cycles because you're still making gains from switching over to a whole different style of training. Um, my switch up between the powerlifting and the bodybuilding was just after the first two years when I started to feel beat up between meets and I felt like it was a good transition because in the first two years you're, you're really gung-ho and you're ready to do meets you feel good you're gonna keep I feel like you're gonna keep increasing numbers in your first two years as long as you're training at a decent level the body's gonna keep adjusting at that point it's until you hit the two three year mark and you've been doing the same stuff over and over where you like I got to get a program I got to rethink what I'm doing I got to start changing things up my joints are hurting, you know? So that's a, at that point, that's when you really gotta, in my opinion, reevaluate what you're doing or maybe take the bodybuilding break in between, you know? I think that's really what it is. is it's not like, uh, it's not so much that someone else's performance makes me feel motivated, but it's just the camaraderie of uh, you guys are lifters um, and they're lifters. And me and, uh, I mean, Garrett was that, you know, I've been lifting with Garrett since before I had any records. He was at the meet. I set my first record in, the last record. So, and we all, you know, we live in different states, but we you know we'll communicate back and forth, ask each other what's going on with the training and everything like that. So, you know, we've got a, you know, it's not just Garrett, you know, Jay and Cade and Richard, even, I mean, there's a bunch of the guys that I've been knowing since before we were all with Animal and, you know, so we're all kind of, we all know what our mindset is and it's all kind of similar, so. All the guys motivate me. I mean, we all great lifters. I mean, obviously Dan's a six-time world record holder. He motivates me. I mean, I think a lot of us have been knowing each other for years. Uh, you know, none of us are really that new to the game. We've been, we've been doing this for a while. So we've been seeing each other at meets for years and years. We built friendships before we had Animal. Um, and yeah, it's always motivating to see these guys uh, do great things. I mean, um, it, it's th that's why this sport's so good. Everyone usually wants to see the next guy do better. I want to thank both Dan and Garrett and Henri for having us here.